you know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason an event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Ferry Podcast, where I will sit down and converse with the superstars, the overachievers, the masters of our craft. Each episode will be a deep dive into their personal philosophies, their habits, the tools they use, and the secrets to not only their success, but overcoming failure as well. First, find somebody you can mimic, then find somebody you can stand, and then try to focus on one style until you master that style. So if you say, I can't do something, well, you're absolutely right. But if you say you're going to, you're absolutely right with that too. People say that you shouldn't define yourself by your work. That is not true. You know what Dave Farley does when he's, you know, lucky enough to be at the World Equestrian Games? I'm watching other people work. Yeah. I don't think uh, we do that enough. This podcast is for all of you out there who share my passion for the job and the desire to always improve. These interviews will put you in touch with the inner workings of the role models we all want to emulate. So let's get to it. You know, there's only so many hours in a day, and it's a matter of what you do with them. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Andrea Dubay. You will probably notice right off the bat that Andrea's particular dialect is tough to place. Sometimes she sounds like a true East Coaster, and others like she's straight off the streets of New York City. Through this conversation, it will become apparent why this is. Part of Andrea's uniqueness and charm comes from the fact that she has embraced the cultural traits of both geographical areas. She can be both down-to-earth and humble, and yet very assertive and direct all at once. Needless to say, she has a great bedside manner, and she is a force to be reckoned with when it comes to her job. When I first met Andrea, I was immediately impressed by her. She spoke to my associates and myself as though we were her peers. She asked our opinions, and we had some great discussions about the cases we were working on together. She even had us assist in a surgery for a horse with a pedal bone infection. Then she started calling me to ask my opinion on a foot issue, or to update me with her findings on a horse we mutually cared for. Andrea always ensured that I was in the loop, and that we were in agreement with the plan going forward. In my practice, I am very fortunate to work with many great vets, and my favorites all take this proactive approach. The others are great, but I sometimes seem to have to chase them for information, or x-rays, or updates. Andrea made it known that we were on the same team, and that my input mattered. Here is Andrea's bio. In 2007, she was a graduate of the Atlantic Veterinary College in PEI. After interning at the New England Equine Practice in Patterson, New York, she remained as an associate for four and a half years practicing predominantly sport horse medicine, thoroughbred and warm blood breeding and geriatrics, working both in the hospital and on the road. From there, she returned briefly to the Maritimes, where she enjoyed the company of cows, standard bred brood mares, and draft horses. Subsequently, Andrea moved back to New York and practiced at the Mid-Hudson Veterinary Practice in Carmel for two years in predominantly sport horse practice and reproduction before returning to her roots here in Canada. Dr. Dubay's passion is breeding, including mare and foal medicine, followed closely by sport horse practice and geriatric medicine. A couple of years ago, Andrea asked me if I would be interested in meeting with her and a group of great farriers from our area. She wanted to share an idea she had for a project. She explained to all of us that she wanted to do some clinics where vets and farriers could come together and learn about equine podiatry. She felt that the vets didn't know enough about what we farriers do and that all of us needed to learn to communicate better. It was a daunting project, but she picked the right group of people to help her out. This is how Foot for Thought was born. If you haven't heard of Foot for Thought, check it out on Facebook. We're a closed group where vets and farriers and other equine practitioners can safely present difficult cases and ask questions without fear of judgment or looking bad in front of clients. The clinics we host are client-free as well for the same reason. Vulnerability is an important concept to Andrea. In the group, we joke that it's her favorite word. I begin our conversation by reading one of her favorite quotes from Theodore Roosevelt. Both the quote and the following conversation will explain where her love for the word comes from. So let's get to it. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, 
or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Andrea Dubay. Thank you very much for coming today. Why is this specific quote so important to you and the others that you work with? The first time I read this quote, it just kind of struck me. And it struck me because it always seemed that the value in things was in the perfectionism of it all. And that the people who could pull it off seamlessly were the winners. And this quote kind of really pointed out to me that it's not about seamless or perfect or appearing ideal. The real work happens, the real wins happen, the real change happens when we're dirty. The aha moments come when you're in the middle of the thick of it and you don't know what you're doing and it's kind of a mess and it's sort of chaos, but that's when it comes through. And then you get your aha, you get your magic. And I think that's true with a lot of things. I think that's true with relationships. I think it's very true for my profession. And if you don't get in it, you are never going to learn what you did, what you could have if you did get in it. And I think that's why it strikes me. It's just a reminder to me to be in the arena, to get dirty, to go there, because that's where the magic happens. Incredible. So how did you first find yourself immersed in the world of horses? I've been around horses since I was a kid, like a small kid. My aunt had horses in New Brunswick at home. I think the first picture of me on a horse is, is at three years of age in a snowsuit in New Brunswick in the dead of winter on a horse named Katie, who was my aunt's dressage horse. But they lived about five hours from us. And my mom and her sister were very close. And, and that cousin is the closest of my cousins. We just grew up that way. We'd go there for Christmas because they could never leave. They had the horses. So we always went there for Christmas and Easter and everything else. And so that's where we were. And we got up in the morning and we fed the horses and then we mocked the stalls and turned out and brought them in. And if we were lucky, we got a lesson one of those two days. And <laughs> And that's kind of how we grew up. So every holiday was around the horses. Every summer vacation, I would go up there for a month or so, and I would stay with my grandparents and then go back and forth between my grandparents and my aunt and my cousin. And that's just how I grew up. So that's how it started. Oh, cool. And I guess that carried on through. Did you ever compete? I did when I was young. I was never a kid whose parents had enough money to have a horse. And so I was the barn rat. You couldn't start taking lessons until you were eight years old in Halifax. And so at eight, I was allowed to start taking lessons and I started my lessons on Friday nights. So I took a lesson once a week. By the time I was 13 or 14, we had switched barns. We had gone to a different barn with my instructor. And at that barn, there was a little bit of opportunity for me to quote unquote catch ride at the time. And so I started riding a little bit more and different horses and, and I would be the kid that rode when somebody went on vacation or whatever and taught some lessons and mucked some stalls. Eventually, I ended up leasing a horse, which I paid for myself. I couldn't do that until I got a job. So I got a job and then I promptly took all the money I made at Kent Building Supplies and uh, leased a horse. And so I showed that horse a little bit. We did low level eventing. He was an ex Grand Prix horse, but had transitioned into eventing and had done some dressage. So we did pretty well, actually. It was in Nova Scotia, but that was a long time ago. So that was the last time I horse showed. I was about 17 or 18. I was in my first year of college. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Now, can you pinpoint the exact moment that you decided you wanted to become a vet? That's an interesting question. People ask that question. I don't think there's a specific moment on the vet side. I remember the first time I thought maybe I would really like to play with horses for the rest of my life. And that was when I was in Truro. I was in the pre-vet program. I was living and working on a dairy farm because if you want to get into vet school, you work on a dairy farm. They had horses. They had standard bred horses and they had bred a mare and her name was Swing Orr and she had a foal. And I remember asking the farmer to make sure I woke up or he woke me up if anything was happening and he didn't, but we were on like hourly alternate checks of this mare through the night and she had foaled and I walked into that barn at two o'clock in the morning or whatever it was and that baby was talking 
he was nickering. <laughs> and I just thought, oh my God, I need to do this. So that was cool. But I actually didn't think it was an option for me really until I had gotten into vet school. I didn't think I would get into vet school. I was fourth on the wait list. And they told me my marks, like my average wasn't high enough. I, I didn't think I'd get in and I got in and then I got there. And so I don't really know when I decided this was the right thing, but it was somewhere in college. And even once I was in vet school, I wasn't convinced I could do it. Really? Mm -hmm. And what do you think changed? I don't know. I think that's the thing about me. I, I just keep doing things until I figure them out. Right. So, <laughs> you know, I had a hard time in vet school. I, um, failed physiology for a semester. I had to write the supplemental exam. I barely passed the supplemental exam. I was on academic probation for a year and a half. The book smart years for me were really hard. I had pretty bad test anxiety and I did not test well. And until we got into the clinics, I did not really come out of my shell. It's interesting because come fourth year, you know, I got the internal medicine award for equine, but it didn't show up until I got out of the books and out of the tests. I think at that point, when I landed the internship in New York, I think that's when I realized, holy crap, I'm going to do this. So what got you through those tough times in school? Was it just sheer determination that you had this goal at the end of it? A little bit. It was a little bit like, I'm not going to let them beat me. The, the physiology professor, he was an interesting person. I, I don't know if he'll ever hear this podcast, but you know, he came into the class the first day First class, first day of vet school. And he said, if you can't master this class and if you can't get a 80 or more in this class, you will never make a good veterinarian. Oh, nice. I mean, he scared the crap out of us and everybody went around and was terrified to fail that class. And then I went and did it. When that happens, after that, it's like, well, I'm going to prove you right. And I think a lot of things in my life are like that. I've been told quite a few times, no, you're not. You know, you can't. You're going to prove them wrong. I definitely have that. You watch me. Right. Attitude. In terms of vet school and how did I get through it, I mean, a little bit of it was just smart assery, like, watch this. And <laughs> hold my beer. <laughs> a little bit of that. But then there was also my family was not that far away and they were pretty supportive. When things got tough, I would call and my dad would come or my mom would come. At that time, I had a really good partner who I ended up marrying who was super supportive. I. Did not find the vet school class all that helpful. I did have a couple of good friends who were not the type A perfectionists who kind of helped me through that. A couple of real good friends who, who really kind of drug me through and said, no, nah, no, nah, you're going to figure this out. Let's sit down here and, and do that. And they were incredible and probably the reason I got through. And a couple of really super inspiring professors, Wendy Duckett was one of them. Um, Sean McKenna was one of them. You know, people who kind of would look at things and be like, Andrea, this part's hard for you, but look at you in the barn. Like, you've got this. Don't worry about it. Chris Riley. They were really, really, really influential in making sure that I got to where I needed to be. The other part of it is that I had gotten a horse when I was in college. A hand-me-down, Appaloosa, horrible feet, lame. But I loved that horse. He was my first horse. And if I had a bad day at school, I would go out to the barn and I would sit in that horse's stall on a flake of hay and I would give that thing peppermints. And I couldn't do much else with him. I clicker trained him to go all kinds of places because we had to clicker train in vet school. That was one of the projects. But I'd sit in the barn. And then the other thing I did, because I had to, I, was, I always worked. And so from the dairy farm I had been on in Nova Scotia, they had gotten me a job with a dairy farm in PEI. And so I always milked cows. And so I'd get up on the weekends at 4.30 or 4 and go to see Bruce and Bruce and I would milk some cows. <laughs> I could go milk cows again. I would never work on cows as a vet ever again. I did that for a little bit. But there's something about going to get those cows in the morning and caring for them that just kind of quiets your brain. Milking cows is like a meditative state. Yeah, I would agree. I think those things outside of the friends and the connections, but I, th I still think the people, and maybe it was Bruce Wood, maybe it was the people at the barn where my horse was. I don't know, but... I think the relationships and the connections are the things that got me through. Incredible. Now, when you said about the test anxiety, you must have found ways to overcome that because you did pass those tests. I know a lot of farriers that hesitate to approach even the CF or the CJF exam because of the written component of it. And it's because they don't test very well. Do you have any tips on how to approach those? I don't have any really good tips. 
I had not found meditation at that time. I used to get quiet. You know, all the other students would be in the cafeteria and they'd all be reading and asking each other questions and double checking. And to hear them saying the answers to the questions out loud would make me panic. So I used to stay away from everybody. And I used to go sit in the barn or go sit downstairs where nobody could find me. And I would walk in last minute, last minute before the test. And I would sit down, I would put in earplugs and I would consciously not pay attention to what everybody else was doing because it used to freak me out when the first five people got up and they were done and they would walk out and I'd be like, crap, I'm way too slow. I had to get into a tunnel where it was just about me and that piece of paper and it didn't matter how long it took me. Fortunately, except for the board exams, that was a fun one. Most of the tests weren't timed or you had an hour, but an hour was plenty long. Every once in a while, you'd come up against the end of the time. But at that stage, you know, you've done all you can anyway. You're looking through the questions. You're double checking your answers. You're probably just screwing things up. (laughs) So you might as well put it down. But that's how I did it. It wasn't easy and I didn't have a magic trick. They put me on Ritalin halfway through testing. So I'm not saying Ritalin's the right answer. But if you're a little ADD, maybe that's helpful. Coming up to a big test, maybe there's some stuff there. We never thought I was ADD until I got to vet school. And then they were like you've got ADD. And I was like, "Hmm." I think, honestly, it was probably more test anxiety. But that did help. It it put me in the zone. Oh, cool. So what did you do once you were out of vet school? Where did you head to next? You know, that whole story is kind of like a series of fortunate events. I don't call myself a lucky person. I don't think I'm lucky. But I think I'm really fortunate. The radiology professor at the vet school was double boarded radiology and surgery in equine. And she kind of came to me about halfway through fourth year. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know yet. I'm going here. I'm going there for externships. And she said, you need to go see these guys. So she sent me up an interview, which I went for a full day while I was at BW Furlong's externing. I went to New England Equine Practice and I got in the truck and rode around with Gabe for a day and he hired me at the end of the day. And that was just good luck. New England was really fortunate for me for a couple of reasons. One, it's one of the bigger practices in the United States. The surgeons there are incredible. The horse population is phenomenal. And next to Wellington, Westchester County, New York is probably one of the highest end horse areas in the U.S. And somehow I landed an internship there. So that was really fortunate. Gabe and I clicked that day. I met Gabe. I rode around with Gabe. We went to some barns, saw some horses. I don't know what he liked about me, but he offered me the job before I left. Come to find out that's how he does things. (laughs) And then he gives you a small amount of time to decide, but that's what he does. And so I took that job. It was like immersion in a type and setting of horses that I'd never seen before in my life. My mind was blown. And then I did my internship We did some crazy things. I saw so much. When I left PEI, I didn't think horses survived colic surgery. Hmm. For the people that don't know, it's a five-hour drive from Halifax to the island, and there's a bridge, and you have to get across the bridge. So we had, in vet school, horses stuck on the far side of the bridge in the winter, down in trailers that couldn't get to the surgical facility to get cut. So the outcome was never good because it took too long to get them to surgery. When I got to New England, one of the first horses we cut was like a 21-year-old with 20 feet of dead small intestine, and he lived. And I was mind-boggled. So just being in that situation and then walking into the barns of Olympians and being allowed to, like, vaccinate their horses. I was Like, I was allowed to vaccinate, and I was thrilled that I was allowed to touch these things. It was life-altering, and I think it hooked me really, really well. Other than colics, what were some of the other fairly common ailments or injuries that you ran into down there? So I was there after I finished my internship, they foolishly offered me an associate job and I took it. And so I think I was at New England altogether for four and a half years. It started out that I was the kid that sat up with the colics all night and went to surgery and dealt with sick horses and the pneumonias and the the fractures and the laminitises and a lot of medical colics, like a lot, a lot of colics. New England is phenomenal at colics. That is one of their strengths. Neurectomies. And, you know, you would scrub for surgery and then you'd go out on the road and you would do all the road things. So you would vaccinate and you would go see the abscess and you would go see the eye. 
one of the other things I got to do was on Wednesdays, Margie Niederland, who is an ophthalmologist who I think is absolutely phenomenal woman and doctor, used to come to the clinic. So it was my job to stand there with Marge and sedate the horses for her and get them ready and, and look at what she was doing. So at every turn, I was kind of immersed in higher levels of medicine. And at every turn, I had an opportunity to learn something because there were medicine specialists, there were farriers, there were ophthalmologists, there were surgeons. Anything you wanted in that area, you could have. And the great benefit to learning there is you got to learn on a group of horses who money wasn't an issue for a lot of them. And the really cool thing about that and that I especially value now is when you learn what you can do or what the options are, you can call somebody and ask like, hey, what's the best thing to do? There's always an answer out there that you didn't know. Mm-hmm. So you better ask a question. And when you have that opportunity, you can learn so much. But what you learn at that level, you can then take to the backyard pony with the lady with 50 bucks. And usually you can MacGyver something that's going to kind of work. I think that's the biggest, coolest thing about that is that we learned on these incredible horses and I got to see what they did at the top, top level. But then you can take it and apply it anywhere. And I think that's so valuable. For sure. Now, you said you worked alongside a lot of farriers down there. Could you name a few of them? You know, it's interesting, the difference between farriers and vets in New York and farriers and farriers in New York and vets and vets in New York and vets and farriers in Ontario and vets and vets in Ontario and farriers and farriers in Ontario. In that part of New York, there are so many vets and there are so many farriers because there are so many horses. And so you are absolutely going to walk into a barn every day and run into another vet. You're just going to do it. Everybody's polite. Everybody's cordial. Everybody shares space. Same thing with the farriers. It never even entered my mind to not be nice to the farriers because everybody would walk into the barn and be like, hey, how's it going? And so that was just a culture that existed there. And if I walked in and saw a farrier and didn't say hello, somebody would be like, who the hell is that? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like some kind of Eden. Sure. There were farriers who did not get along and vets and farriers who did not get along. And there were people I avoided. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure people who avoided me. But it was different there. Who were the farriers in New York who influenced you the most? There were quite a few of them that I worked with there. And, and I was lucky in that the practice worked with a bunch of guys. But probably the first guy that I ever really had to work with and ever had a case with myself was Jamie Cassano. Jamie always worked pretty closely with Gabe. And so I had a founder pony and I needed some help with it. And so Jamie and I did that case together for the first time. Jamie became a pretty good friend of mine, but also I think for a lot of reasons, one of them being that he didn't have much in the way of ego and and he was always keen to try and figure something out and he was always keen to learn. And so I could call Jamie and say, Jam, I don't know what's going on here. Like, what do I do? And he would say, well, try this. And what's it look like? And what's this? And what's that? And so he would help me when I had no idea what I was doing. Jamie would help me. You know, it got to the point that I was kind of okay at things. And Jamie and I had a really tricky mare who was a fancy, fancy hunter who had found her. And she'd been given away. And a friend of mine took her. And we got her feet under control. And with the idea of if, if we could get her feet under control, if we could get her good, that maybe we'd breed her. So we did get her good. And then we bred her. And then uh, about six months in, she started popping abscesses and doing really, really poorly. Oh. At one point, we stood down in Bedford, in Bedford, New York. There's a little hardware store. And Jamie and I didn't know what else to do with this horse. And we were trying to come up with something. I can't remember what we were trying to do. But I think it had to do with a medicine plate because the mare was foundered and there was abscesses and, and we had to support her, but we couldn't put certain things on her and she didn't like pressure. And anyway, I remember standing down in the hardware store trying to figure out what pieces of metal we could weld together to put on this mare's foot to do what she seemed to need. And that's the way it was with Jamie. You know, we would try something on. If it worked, great. And if it didn't work, we would be back, you know, in two hours or the next day or the next day and we would try again. And that client was so devoted. So he was incredible just because he taught me that it was okay not to get it perfect. And that, you know, we listened to the horses and we could put on the technically most perfect whatever and the horse might hate it. And so if the horse hated it, then it didn't matter what we did. <laughs> so there was no point in leaving it there. So some days we would spend three or four hours trying to find the right thing. And that was okay. But it was also okay to take that time to do that. 
I can't say enough about the time I spent with Jamie. Ray Galuccio was another one. He was a cool, cool guy. Is a cool guy. You know, I didn't know much when I met Ray and I got called. I had a thoroughbred account that I did the broodmare work on. I was told, go sedate the foals for Ray. So I had an appointment. Ray was coming at nine. I walk into the barn and Ray's like, okay, walk that one down, walk it back. And he watches it go and points out a couple of things to me and says, okay, sedate it. And I sedated it. Ray would pick up its feet and he would handle it just so. And they would never scramble on him and they'd always stand and, and he'd roll off their little feet or he'd put it on an Equilox. Then when we were done, he would walk them back. And it was amazing to me just to see the change. You know, sometimes he'd just roll an outside toe on those things and like their little leg would get better. And so doing that and him taking the time to show me what he was doing, you know, it was a whole set of skills that I never would have got anywhere. That's the thing about vet school is they don't teach you these things. They tell you they're possible, but nobody ever gets down on the ground and is like, hey, watch this. That never happens. Jimmy Madden was another cool one. Jimmy and Brad, they're kind of a team down there. Jimmy's a funny guy. He's a good farrier, but my God, he's funny. And <laughs> more than anything, like I'd walk into the barn and Jimmy would just crack me up and we'd do some work and we did some cool things and stuff like that. But Jimmy kind of always just gave us the sense that you didn't have to be so bloody serious all the time. <laughs> And it was okay to have fun and do work and be collegial and, and stuff like that. And, you know, we had some rodeos, Jimmy and Brad and I as well. But yeah, like whenever you saw Jimmy, it was like a good day because you ran into Jimmy. George Fitzgerald, that's an interesting one. George, uh, George is a pretty big deal. And so George was kind of like running into the king. And so as the young vet, you don't want to piss George off, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> you just want to like be under the table and like make the man happy seen and not heard, seen, not heard, like all of that. Right. And so George used to have to come to the clinic. Dr. Bradley would call him to work on some fancy horse. And I don't know what the conversation ever was going into that other than I found out that George was coming and I needed to be there for radiographs. And that was my job. And I would take radiographs for George and God love the man. He never complained. I don't think about my radiographs and they probably weren't very good at that time, but he would look at things and he would do some things and he would chew that horse and I would kind of ask a question or two, but I didn't ever want to bother him. So I wouldn't like ask him a lot of questions. I was scared. I reserved that for like the other guys that I was more comfortable with. George was always kind of like the king on the pedestal that I didn't want to, A, I didn't want him to know I was stupid, <laughs> <laughs> which is ridiculous now because if you run into George Fitzgerald at a clinic and you say, hey, George, can you explain this to me? George will like go get a piece of paper. He will sit down maybe grab a beer depending on what time of the day it is and we will sit down have a beer and he will talk through the whole thing he has not got an ego as far as i've ever known he is happy to share what he knows and what he thinks and what he learns and so that's a whole other set of things too like it doesn't matter how big or what level horses or where they've been it really doesn't matter there's no reason that we can't all be nice to each other. And there's no reason that I can't share my experience with you. And that's all he was doing. Like, I think if you asked George, maybe you should ask George. That's in the works. I, I have spoken to him. George was just happy to share his experience. It didn't really seem to matter. But if you were keen and you wanted to know, George was happy to always tell you, regardless of the Olympic horses or the high level horses that he had worked on it, that didn't really matter. He was just happy for a keen person to absorb what he had learned. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And to the other part, it was a shock almost when I came to Ontario because I had been in New York. Not that everybody got along with me, not that we all were BFFs, not that there weren't farriers who didn't like me or I didn't like particular farriers, but everybody was courteous and, you know, it was nice. <laughs> it was nice in general. I got to Ontario and the wildest thing like I picked up the phone when I got here because I blocked a suspensory on a horse and, you know, I wanted to call a farrier and be like, hey, I've got a suspensory. What do you want to do with the shoeing? Like I couldn't get guys to call me back. <laughs> and it took me a while until I came across, I think you were one of the first people to call me back, Brian. Justin Argent called me back. Barney. God love Barney. And Kath. And it's kind of funny that this is all turned into what it is, but you guys were the first ones when I got here that were like willing to play in the sandbox, which was so different than what I was used to in, in New York. Like, I actually didn't understand why they wouldn't call me back. And I think I remember, like, driving one day, talking to you, Brian, being like, how come they won't call me? Yeah. Yeah. I, you were asking advice on how to get a particular farrier to call you back. Yeah. Maybe that was foreign, too. But that's what I did in New York. Like, if I didn't know how to handle a guy, I'd call one of the other guys and be like, what do I do? 
<laughs> like how how do I this situation's tricky. You know, how do I handle this best with this person, with this personality, with this client, with this owner, with this trainer? You know, they were always there for me. And if one guy was like, mm, they'd say, oh, call this person and see if that works. So it was interesting for me having you approach me that way in asking, how do I get a hold of this farrier? You're right. That was a unique experience for me. And there are vets that do work with us. And I had had that experience several times before, but there were also many who wouldn't. They would say the tenant is injured, but they wouldn't say which one and wouldn't actually communicate with you like it was a struggle to get a hold of them so you could find out what the plan going forward could be for it. So anytime I think for all of us in that group or any farrier that has dealt with you, when you're eager to communicate and talk about it, first of all, we get nervous, but then second of all, we get excited because it's an opportunity where... You know, she actually does care what my opinion is and we can discuss this and it doesn't seem like we're going to get thrown under the bus for when things go wrong. Like I said, you weren't the only one, but for somebody new coming in and that's how you approached us right off the bat, I think that's why we all were quite enthralled to have you and to work with you. And it became, it's almost like a weekly thing that we can actually discuss cases and what are you doing on it? What have you discovered? And by working back and forth, I've noticed even the clients really enjoy the fact that they know we're communicating. It makes a huge difference to their horses and how they perform. I think it's really important and it has done some pretty incredible things for all of us. I think that clients notice for sure too. And it's almost gotten to the point with some of our clients where it's like expected. Yes. <laughs> They'll just look at me and be like, you talk to Brian. <laughs> And then I'll have to call Brian and be like, I forget what you told me. <laughs> and I almost set that expectation with my clients too, because frankly, if they don't want me to talk to the farrier, like if it's a confidentiality thing where I can't call the farrier and be like, hey, I'm dealing, I'm, I'm seeing this. What do you think? I don't want to be in that situation. I don't want to work in that situation. We're all on a team. We work on nice horses. If everybody's not on the team, well, what the hell is the point? Like we need an entire team to work on the horses that we're working on. So if one part of the whole system is not in check, then it's not going to work. You know, if I can't talk to you or if you can't talk to me, one of us is going to lose the account. Mm -hmm. I guess that's another thing. Like, I'm no angel. I lost one farrier in account and I really regret it now. It came down to the fact that I didn't know how to communicate with him better. You know, he had a certain skill set and he tended to do things a certain way and he tried. You know, I would show up with the x-rays, we'd look at things, you know, he'd do his trim, we would set the shoe on the foot, we'd x-ray it, we'd do the whole game, and he would have it right with me standing in front of him. And I never could get it going the way that the client could perceive that it was right. And I lost him that account. And I really regret that now. Actually, I think it made more room in his schedule and he was able to take a huge account, which I guess worked out. But he's a nice guy and he was doing his best. And I didn't have a better way to handle it at the time. And so I really regret that. It's one thing Jamie always used to say. Everybody's got to eat. You don't want to take his meal away. So don't take his meal away. And I think that's true. I've got to eat. You've got to eat. We've all got to eat. So don't take people's meals away if you don't have to. I mean, there's other people that I've dealt with that have been really, really difficult. But I try to never take anybody's meal away. Right. I'm going to get fired. You're going to get fired. We're all going to get fired. <laughs> it happens all the time, it unfortunately. Yep. More than we'd like and more than our egos can stand some days. And But it's going to happen. So let them do it. Let's not do it to each other. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Sometimes we just can't communicate. I can't put the words in for the guy across the table from me to understand what I'm trying to say. That's a challenge. But I think there's ways to do it. What are some things in conversations you've had with farriers or that you've heard the farriers had with their client that they've said about the stuff that kind of pertains to your sandbox that maybe we as farriers should be more aware of how it could be taken out of context or used against the vet because i mean i know there are situations where the farrier can even cause a lot of heartache for the vet and even cause them to lose an account number one it's not the foot. <laughs> I hate when people say that. Honest to God, it probably is the foot. <laughs> 
no offense, it might not have anything to do with the hoof. Right. Right? But it's probably the foot. Like nine times out of ten, it's going to block to below the fetlock. And so it's probably down there somewhere. You know, none of the people I work closely will say this. And none of the guys that do the clinics regularly will say stuff like this, I don't think anymore. But but my God, it's definitely the shoulder. Oh, is it? <laughs> really? Let me block the shoulder. And then let's see. You know, and I've actually gone and done that sometimes. I had one situation actually that a farrier told the client that the vet needed to come with an ultrasound because it was definitely the tendon, which was interesting. So I went and it was a hind leg and the farrier had actually sent an apprentice of his. He couldn't be there, but he sent the apprentice to see the ultrasound. So I go there and the pulse is booming on this thing. And I said, I think it might be the foot. <laughs> <laughs> and so I throw the hoof testers on the thing and it's screaming. And then I'm like, well, I don't know the apprentice. I've never met him. I'm trying not to be a jerk. I said, well, let's go to the ring. Let's flex it. And so we go to the ring and I crank on the leg and nothing really happens. And I crank on the hawk and nothing really happens. And and then I put like a huge pressure on the suspensory and jog the thing off and nothing really happens. And so then I put the hoof testers on the sore spot and jog the thing off and it crippled away. Surprising. I mean, sometimes I think I know. And sometimes I don't know. But I think the thing is, when you don't know, just say you don't know, but it'll really peeve off a vet if you call into the clinic and be like, yeah, you need to ultrasound that horse. Let me do my job too. You know, I'm trying really hard to let you guys do your jobs. I try really hard, especially now. I wasn't very good when I was younger. And so to anybody in New York who had to deal with me when I was younger, I wasn't good. I'm sorry. I try pretty hard now to let you guys do what you do and, and talk about it. Like, hey, it's sore here. I don't know if it's the nail or not, but this is what I'm getting. What do you think? Do you remember anything about when you put that shoe on, et cetera? Does that make sense? Yep, yeah, for sure. Do you know what's really cool to the flip side of all of that, though? I've got one farrier who I adore, but who also drives me insane. We, <laughs> I walked into a farm one day and they said, so-and-so said you need to do the hawks on this horse. And I said, oh, did he? Yeah. And I said, let me call him. And so I called him and I said, I hear, I hear you think I need to do the hawks on this horse. And he goes, yeah, it's just land and narrow. I was like, since when is this your wheelhouse? And he goes, well, that's just, that's what I think. And so I busted his chops a little bit and we're good friends. So I could, but he goes, honestly, they just need to let you do the vet work. And I was just trying to get it so that you could do the vet work so I could get under the horse and not break my bloody back. I just want his hawks done. Come on. And so like the motivation, I think, is sometimes completely legitimate, right? Like you yeah. guys are seeing changes in their feet that you know are not normal. And that's kind of been a new evolution for me with the group of people I'm working with now. If there is a change to a foot, you guys will call and say, hey, this foot started doing this. Is there something going on in this leg or in the other leg? Did you inject something? And then I'll call and say, hey, I did hawks and coffins on this horse or I did the SI. Let me know if anything changes. And then you call in four weeks and say, yeah, it's kind of coming around like this. This is a growth opportunity for all, all of us. us which we haven't been taking advantage of and we haven't been using. And I'm not learning about the true effect of the work I'm doing if I'm not talking to you. And I don't know that you're learning about everything else if, if you're not talking to me. So I genuinely think that for the horse, it's better. And if I inject something and the foot doesn't change, that's probably equally useful information, right? The rider says it's better. But something's still not right because this foot is still doing this weird thing that it's been doing for only like three months now. Why? Right. So we're not to the bottom of it. There's a lot of ways to tell these things. And my eyes can't see all of it all the time. You know, the rider can't feel all of it all the time. And we have the benefit of seeing it every four or five weeks. And we see the change happen despite what we're trying to do. Having all of those eyes on it and them being able to communicate what they see. I think that's, that's another thing. Vets forget, like you guys are on the farm every five weeks, every six weeks in the woods, you know, maybe it's every, depending on where you are, maybe it's every eight. Yeah. But in the really high performance barns, yeah, I'm probably in the barn every week, but there are barns that I'm not in but twice a year. So you're, the farriers are the consistent care in the horse. It's not a vet. So if a farrier in one of those barns notices something odd, it's probably worth listening to. It's probably worth thinking about. It's probably worth having a conversation about. So it annoys me when people think they don't need the input of others at all, ever. Mm -hmm. Because I genuinely believe that we can grow so much on our own in our little vacuum, but you can only grow to a certain level and you have to get into the arena after that. For sure. It's a beautiful segue into Foot for Thought. 
when did you start to come up with that concept and what inspired it? This is funny. So I was in BC at an ISELP, which is the International Society for Locomotor, whatever, equine pathology, which is the fancy Denois clinics that they do, if you don't know. I was doing hip and pelvis, but they added a one-day farrier vet short course on podiatry and biomechanics. And so I sat through that course with a fairy friend of mine. I realized that day that I had no idea what I was talking about and what I had been telling people. And I also realized that day that what I had been prescribing was maybe the wrong thing. And then maybe I wasn't doing the right thing. And, and all along I had believed that I was doing the right thing because I was saying what I had always heard and what I thought was the right thing to do. And then there's this little French man standing up there and he's got all of these images and videos and all kinds of crazy information that is counterintuitive to everything I ever thought. And I realized that I was maybe doing it wrong, doing a disservice to the horses rather than a service to them. And basically, maybe I was just botching the whole thing. <laughs> And so that was kind of like a holy crap moment because that's like the exact opposite of what you aspire to do as a vet, right? Like you want to help, you want to make things better, you want to he have them heal, you want to have them go back to work. And so just the idea that maybe, maybe I didn't know was horrifying to me. Now that it's been pointed out and now that I've gotten more into it, the data set that Denois teaches from is not the biggest data. There needs to be more proof. And an inferior in particular, there's almost no data. Like the research is really poor. So we come up with these new ideas. It works. We try it. But that's kind of like equine medicine, right? Like there's not a ton of research in equine medicine because it's a relatively small number of dollars compared to big pharma in the US or big pharma in, in the world. And so the research doesn't get done except for on small scale. And when it does, there's one or two studies or one or two papers or a case study. But there's not these huge swaths of good information to say, yes, this is definitely the right way to go. And so, yeah, we shockwaved suspensories and then we bone marrowed suspensories and then we did stem cells on suspensories and then we PRP'd them and then we went back to shockwaving them and then we lasered them. These things just seem to happen in cycles. And I think shoeing sort of seems to happen in cycles, too. For sure. But I guess the point of all that is it was the first time that I realized that maybe I had just been way too small minded and should be thinking outside of the box. And then, you know, I'm a horse vet. I don't own a practice. My thought was, how the heck am I going to learn all of this stuff that I don't know? And the easiest, most accessible way to do that was to call my friends and be like, hey, want to do a project? <laughs> <laughs> And basically the original idea of it was like organized vet farrier playtime because I realized that in sitting in that room next to my farrier friend, I realized that there was a whole bunch of stuff that he understood that I knew nothing about and he could explain the impact and the mechanics of that I had never even considered. And maybe I'm just slow. You know, maybe everybody else is ahead of me on that, but I think that if I was sitting in that room, you know, nine years out of vet school, after a big internship, after working out of fancy practice, I have to think that maybe we're missing the boat on it a little bit. And so, honestly, selfishly, initially, the idea for the group was so that I could learn more. It turned into something after that. But the initial thing was so that I could learn more. As it turns out, it seems like everybody else wanted to learn more, too. So yeah. I think we share on that. For sure. When you first approached us about the project, I don't think any of us saw it, that it could go where it went so quickly that we had so many attendees, only a couple of clinics in, and it just showed how many, especially farriers, how many of them were very interested in finding out the, the vet side of things and looking for an environment where they could speak or, or ask questions without feeling dumb for doing it. That was one of the key things that you insisted on, that the environment would be free of clients or other people that could 
judge you or think, well, why doesn't my vet or my farrier understand this? Why are they asking that question? Because a lot of the ignorance probably stems from that exact problem where we're not free to talk to each other, especially in environments where there is a little bit of a, a conflict between the two or where information's being hoarded that you're afraid to ask because you could get thrown under the bus and lose that account and not be able to eat that night. I think that's the whole thing though, right? Like we are sitting here and I think it's a generational thing maybe because it seems like and I can't say this is consistent for everywhere I've worked. I've worked in New York, New Brunswick, back in New York, and then here. And I traveled to Wellington. But I don't think it's consistent everywhere. But I think there is a generational thing in vets. And maybe it's just an ego thing. Maybe it's not generation. Maybe there's somebody like this in every generation. I don't know. But there are definitely that type of vet who always needs to give a solid answer. And it might not be the right solid answer, but they're going to tell you it's the solid answer. And that is this is what's wrong with this horse and it's going to do this. I don't know how you can be that certain. Every time I have ever said this is definitely going to happen to this horse, the opposite thing has happened because they're horses and that's what they do. I think horses chuckle when they humble us. I think <laughs> I think that's the thing with horses. You're like, yeah, this is definitely the perfect shoe. It's going to make it better. Everything's going to go great. Now, you say that about vets. There are farriers who feel that they have to have the same certain answer and that the more confident they are in it the more right it is yes mm -hmm. and the horses definitely do humble us because something that's worked a hundred times on the hundred and first the exact opposite could happen and they could go backwards i've learned and i know many of the people from the group that i've spoken with when we had the candid conversations afterwards have learned not to be so certain don't make promises because in the end, it's a veterinary practice and it's a farrier practice. And I think the practice part, I mean, we are working from a strong foundation of the knowledge that has been acquired, but there's still a lot more to learn and we're only going to get there through trying. You know, there's an interesting saying, and I don't know if it's in medicine in general or just in vet medicine or, or what, but I've heard it over and over again. And they say that the most you ever knew was the day you graduated vet school. And it's because at that point, you think you understand it all. You're like, I've read the books. I took the board. I did it. They let me out. They call me doctor. I'm there. And you're so certain of what the book says. And you're so certain of the way that the guy in vet school taught you and or the girl, the woman, it's probably been a woman now, right? Like, <laughs> honestly, it's mostly women teaching in vet school, you know, but you're so certain that that's the right thing. And I don't know that I really, really got it, but there are a couple horses that have really taught me that no matter how well I think I thought I knew, there's always something else going on. The best story I have about this is I went to see this colic. It was a god awful colic. Horse was down. Couldn't actually get the horse up, drugged the snot out of it, still couldn't get it up, scanned it on the ground, rectaled it on the ground, tubed it on the ground, like could not get the horse off the ground. Said to the client, we have to put this horse down. Like this is inhumane. We have to put it down. Client's like, no, give it a bunch of drugs, go home. I'm like, no, this is not fair. Can't do it. Like thinking about threatening the SPCA. Client's like, nope, horse is going to be fine. Go home. Okay. So after like an hour of this, I think I ran at some fluids in the middle of an arena in the middle of the night. I go home. You know, I go home at like two. I wake up at like eight. I haven't heard from the lady. I call her because, I'm. you know, the plan is after she goes through the three doses of Trank that I left, et cetera, that I'm going to go put down the horse. That's the deal we made. And so I get there. I wake up and I call her and she doesn't call me back. And so she calls back at about 11 o'clock that morning. She's like, yeah, she's fine. She's out in the field eating grass. I would have sworn in that moment that that horse could have not survived and everything that that client was making me do was completely not in the best interest of the horse. We are not always right. right. No matter how much we think we know, there is always the factor that it's a horse. There is always that. And with these people who are so certain, you know, they amaze me. Like I, I sit in awe of them because they stand there and they say these things like they're certainties. And I'm just like, where does your horse population come from? Because mine does not behave like that. 
I'm a person who sees things in grays anyway. Like I'm not a black and white person. But I really think that the people who are standing there with such certainty are doing us all a disservice. I don't think it's helping anything or anyone. I think one of the biggest things that I learned early on in my career from the people who mentored me was that it's okay to say you don't know. I've gotten pretty comfortable. I hate saying I don't know. Don't get me wrong. I hate not having an answer. But it blocks to the low four and it's not the suspensory. I don't know. Hmm. Well, how are we going to find out? Well, we got to put it in a magnet. It doesn't, you know, there's nothing to see on the ultrasound. People hate to hear that. Yeah. You want to be able to say, yes, it's definitely the suspensory. But if you can't see the hole on the suspensory, if you can't see the change, then you can't say it's a suspensory and you need to say, I don't know. And that we have to do more diagnostics or choose not to. And that's okay. But you have to be able to say, I don't know. And I think a big part of what's cool about the group is somebody will ask me a really smart theory driven question about something in depth to do with farrier. And I have no idea what the answer is. None. And I get to say, I don't know, but then I'll look around the room and there'll be some other good vet or good farrier standing around and be like, what do you think? And then we have a conversation and then the conversation gets stirred up and people throw out a couple ideas and that's where the magic happens. And that's where we all learn and grow. And that's what I love about it so much. What are some of the things that you've learned through the Foot for Thought group about chewing that you didn't know before? Everything. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly, like, it's really interesting. I, I especially benefit when we make a plan on a clinic. We decide we're going to do collateral ligaments. Well, then I actually have to sit down and figure out why it is that the things work. So it leads to lively debates amongst us all on For why. Sure. And, you know, if you need to argue a point to a couple of heated farriers who are your friends who are not scared to tell you you're wrong, you know, you better know your stuff and you better be right. So it makes me look into it all better because I have to teach it and I have to present the information in a way that everybody's going to understand it. So that part I think is really, really helpful. But also, I don't know how many times I've said to you guys, like, guys, but why? Like, how does this work? What do you mean when you do this to this shoe, this happens? Like, what? Even just the shoeing vocabulary that I never knew. And still, I still struggle with it. You guys will say words and I'll be like, what are you talking about? And I'm so fortunate to have this group of people with me that I can say, what are you talking about? Like this what do you mean fuller? Like, I still remember asking that question. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that word. Because only because it was like the first one I was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean safing? What do you... There's a whole vocabulary that you guys have that I don't think you realize we don't have. And in the same way where we get talking about nephrosplenics and this and that, like there's a whole vocabulary we have that you guys don't understand. So if we never actually discuss, like cross the line with what's what, then how the heck is anybody ever going to understand and make the horse better? Like, I think at least to some degree, we all need to understand a certain amount of information to be useful. For sure. And to help the horses. In working cases with you, there have been a few things that one example would be heel checks. If they come remotely close to the frog, anybody who works on Andrew's horses will know that she doesn't like that very much. <laughs> Are there any other things you see in shoeing that give you heartburn? That gives me heartburn. And honestly, it's not something maybe you found out that I hate it and then told everybody else that I hate it. And so nobody does it. I don't know. In one of my former career places that I worked, that was a problem. And I don't know if the shoes just stayed on so long that the frog grew down into the heel check and caused a problem. I, I don't know why it was a problem, but I would get called to horses and they would be sore when you pushed on their frogs. <laughs> and it was like, well, it's the stupid piece of metal pushing into his frog. A, to me, it just looks sloppy. It looks like a good spot to trap rocks and things like that. And the word trappy is actually part of the farrier vernacular. Yeah, it looks like a place where things go wrong. But I think that's why the other, everybody knows that Andrea hates soul pressure. That's like my reputation is Andrea hates soul pressure. And I still get a lot of people who are like, there's no good reason for that. There's no good science behind that. And and I acknowledge that maybe that's the case. But I also have seen in multiple occasions, less so in Ontario, which is interesting, but I've seen a lot, a lot of horses. One of the number one calls I will get called out for at night, 
after a horse has been shod is that a horse will have been trimmed short and burned on too tight or trimmed short and the sole pressure not taken away or trimmed short and put a snowball pad on it. And that horse will be crippled and I will have to pull the shoe off at night and set it in something soft for a couple of days. And and that's the problem. So I do have a bit of a thing about it, but going back to working with Jamie, that was one of the things that we learned with that mare. If we didn't have the sole pressure just right, like if we didn't have it ground out everywhere on that mare with all of that disease in the bottom of her foot, she would cripple. And the owner would call us and be like, you must not have gotten it right because she's no good. (laughs) (laughs) Whether I am scientifically right or wrong, I know farriers around the world are going to argue this point. People within the group argue the point on me. But I also just don't see why you need it all the time. Like if grinding out the little rim on the inside of the shoe, like what's that going to hurt? I don't see it. I guess the other reason I'm sensitive to it is because my own horse, we tried one time to give him a more concave foot and and we foundered him. We poured him. I don't know if we put a heart bar or an egg bar on him, but the guys poured him. They were like, Andrea, it's going to be great. Let us try it. We're going to fix his feet. Okay. All right. (laughs) We foundered him. Really? Yeah, we foundered him. We foundered him. Just because of the pressure? Yeah. The pressure founded him. So, you know, like not every horse can take pressure. No, oh, some of them have that princess and the P syndrome, yeah. I think. Yeah. And so I don't know enough to know which ones will and which ones won't. I, I think, don't think anybody does. I just got a farrier on record saying that and I'm taking <laughs> one for the team <laughs> right there. Check for the vet. They'll surprise you. Yeah. If it's something that you don't have to do, why do it? Mm-hmm. So that's a thing that annoys me. Okay. So there must be times when you're working on a case and it becomes apparent to you that whatever is required on the feet is maybe beyond the scope of the farrier that's working on it. What do you do when you've kind of figured that out? Has this happened and and how do you approach that situation? Yeah, it has happened. And I think I've handled it poorly in the past. Like I said, I've gotten a guy or two fired in my life. But I think the best way I ever came across And I think the way that people should consider trying is actually a way that one of the farriers encouraged me to do, one of my phone-a-friend farriers. You know, if you're looking at a foot being like, okay, he's not getting it or she's not getting it, what do we do? If you call that person and say, hey, it doesn't seem like it's coming the way you want it. Is there anything I can do to help you more? And if at that point they might say, you know what? They let this sucker out in six feet of mud for the last eight weeks and I haven't been able to go because they don't want to pay me, whatever. Maybe you're going to find out a new piece of information for one. And maybe that fair is completely capable. It's just that the client's not setting them up. It also opens the conversation for the farrier to say, you know what? I'm not comfortable with it. I know what needs to be done, but I don't know how. I don't Mm -hmm. have the skill in my toolbox. There's a way to handle that, with which I think is pure genius. If you say to them, well, is there somebody that you'd be comfortable asking to come in with the three of us to do it together? They will almost always say, you know what? My friend so-and-so is really, really good at this. Would you be all right if he came in and helped me? Perfect. So we all stand there. The client's happy. I think that's a great, great way to handle things. I think, A, if I haven't been able to communicate to that farrier what needs to be done, then I need to learn how to communicate better. If the farrier doesn't know how to do it, you know, build up a heel, do something crazy. I don't know, like something with glue, a polyflex shoe. I don't know, whatever. Then they're going to gain a skill set. And you might also learn more because I think what we as vets mess up, we have these ideas of what we think should happen to these feet, but we're not understanding what's going on with the feet themselves or why a certain shoe might not work for a certain horse or why gluing or wedging or whatever might not work in the situation we're working in. So unless you take the time to ask, like, what is the challenge here? You're not going to find out. I think that's the best way I know how to deal with that problem is, say, is there somebody you'd be willing to have come in and help and let the farrier choose who they're willing to work with? I've never had that situation go wrong before. I don't know. Do you have any ideas on that one? Well, no, that's interesting because Ray, in my talk with him, he actually touched on the exact same solution. He said that it's more common now. It wasn't something that happened before, but where if you ran into a special case, rather than 
using up all of your time. Actually, Ray and Dave Farley said the same thing. Yeah, Dave Farley said it. Yeah, that you'll end up losing money because you can't charge for enough time to actually address the situation and you're losing time that you could be doing other horses in your practice and that by bringing in somebody who specializes in that specific kind of issue or who does glue-ons and you don't happen to, the client's happy because they've got somebody who they're actually happier to pay for it and you've learned something. You might learn how to, to put those on for the next time. Or you might decide you don't want to, but you have somebody you can call and do that moving forward. So there are some people who just really want to specialize in the special cases, the podiatrists. And I think it's becoming more of a common thing. There's that stigma that I think a lot of farriers suffer from where they believe that if they do that, they're going to lose the account to that person. That the, the client's going to automatically think, well, that guy is obviously a better farrier. Maybe we should use him where you're actually doing better for the horse. You're just bringing in a specialist for a specific case. You're taking your ego out of it. Yeah. Every time I've seen that situation go down, be it with a vet and a vet or a farrier and a farrier, every single time I've seen that situation take place in front of my eyes, I've never once seen the vet or the farrier, whoever, the top guy, the guy who's in to help, I've always seen them be like, no, your regular guy can do this next time. No big deal. Mm -hmm. They always try and give the business back. They always try and encourage your client that, you know, we've got this under control. And if, if he needs my help, he'll call me. I'll come back in another couple of times and we can do it again. But people are out there to actually take care of each other. So I don't know why we are all hellbent that everybody is trying to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is this? I don't know. Like, I've never actually seen it go the other way. I'm sure there are stories. And there must be. I'm sure there are. But I, I want to think we're doing better. And I want to think that we're going to continue to do better. The flip side of it is I don't do much in the way of teeth. There are people who are better at it. Cool. Let them do it. Let them do it. I'll do what I do. It's not actually worth my time to do certain things anymore because I make more dollars per hour doing what I do. So fine. Call the person who's really good at that. They're going to do a better job of it anyway. Mm -hmm. Cool. This question is something that I've asked several farriers, and I thought it'd be interesting from a vet's perspective. How do you approach situations where the client is requesting something to be done that you don't feel is right for the horse? You know, we get put in that position sometimes, depending on the type and level of horses, maybe sometimes more than others. It's challenging, and I think it's different for every vet. I think there are certain things that I am pretty comfortable that. I can do this. It's probably not going to do any harm. I don't think it's going to help the horse, but he doesn't really care what I think. <laughs> so I can do it. It's probably not going to hurt. When I occasionally get put in the spot where somebody asks me to do something that I think actually will hurt the horse, we have a, a talk at that point where I say, I don't think this is the right course of action. I'm not convinced that it's going to do what you think it's going to do. You know, sometimes it gets to the point where I say I'm not comfortable doing it. I guess it depends on what it is. Sometimes I will do it and I will say, okay, we'll do it this once. But if it doesn't give you the desired outcome, then we're going to do this. And it might be injected tox. Prime example, injected tox. Okay, do you want it looked at? Nope, I want you to inject the hox. Technically, we're not supposed to do that, right? Like legally, we're not supposed to do that. You know, we're supposed to do an exam, but They've had the horse for six years. Every time it starts losing its leads, it's its hawks. Inject the hawks. Okay. That's one thing in that situation where I have a long history and it's always been the thing with the horse. The flip side is maybe it's a suspensory this time. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> so in those situations where like I grab the suspensory and I'm like, injecting the hawks might get you next week, but it's not going to get you next month. That is harder for me. So I will say to them, this is my concern. That thing is sore today. If I inject those hawks and it's got a suspensory lesion and we don't look into it and you go jumping on that, it's going to be really good for a week or two and then it's going to be busted. What do you want to do? And I put it like that. And I'm not popular with all trainers because I put it like that. I'm probably never going to work on an Olympic course because of that. Because there are things that horses need to do to get going places. If it gets to that point where it's got a big class, it's got to go. 
and we've got to make a choice, then, you know, I put it on them. This is the information I have. These are the things we can do. I need you to own that every class we do might be the last one. If they will own it, then I will do it. But honestly, it makes me sick. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't sit right in my stomach. I try not to work at the level where that is a regular thing I have to do. I don't really ever want to be the person making a call on the last day of a horse's career. Right. It happens sometimes. There are places, you know, we're shocking when we should be resting and, and we're lasering when we should be resting. And Sometimes the horse has just got to go. It's really unfortunate. But the other thing is records. If I'm in those situations, the records are clear. And if the trainer's telling me what the owner's absentee, it's saying trainer said blank, blank, blank. And I cover my butt really, really well that way. There are a few takeaways for farriers in that. And one of them being just what you just said. For us, if it's something, I think it's better to have it in text or in writing. I know writing isn't something that we commonly run across, but we need to know or we need to put the onus on the owner if they're asking for us to do something we aren't comfortable with. I think I've heard the same thing explained in the context of if a vet asks a farrier to do something. I've asked that question to several farriers and often the response is, if they don't think it's detrimental, I'll try it. And if it doesn't work, then we can do it my way. And I think what you're saying is kind of a similar approach. We do that a lot. We do a similar approach a lot. Yeah, sure, I'll inject the coffin. But if he's lame in three weeks, then I get to work it up. Mm -hmm. You know, that that is a deal I strike often, which it is what it is. But they also know that if the joint injection wears off in two weeks or three weeks, they know they have a problem. Yeah. You know, either we're going to go to pretty heavy imaging or, you know, blocking imaging, whatever, or we're going to go rest it. If it's a horse without a big budget, then it's going to go stand or rest for a period of time and they're going to bring it back out again in a couple of weeks. So I, I think it's a similar thing. You know, there are real gamey people out there that will do gamey things and thank goodness for them because they drive the aggressive end of the sport and the medicating forward. You know, if there weren't those vets out there who will stick things in places that you're like, oh my goodness, there was always a first, you know, there was a first guy to stick HA in a horse's stifle. Mm -hmm. And then there was a first guy to stick Prostride in there. And there was a first guy to stick all of these things somewhere. And so thank goodness that there are those people. I will never be one of those people ever. That is not my wheelhouse. But there's always going to be that guy who's willing to try, who's not that risk averse and who's got that group of clients who are like, most of the time our clients are kind of like us. Yep, for sure. So there's always going to be that person who's going to do that. And thank goodness, because if it didn't, medicine wouldn't move forward. It would be glacial. So thank goodness for them, but I'm just not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I've learned from working with you is this concept of not being so nonchalant when we do discuss cases, like say I run into you at a barn and I hadn't experienced it as much before where you're very concerned about the confidentiality, the name of the horse or the barn that it's in. And it was something I, I hadn't been aware of. Why is it important to you? I didn't know I did this until you asked me about this. It's the way I was taught. I think that's cut my teeth in New York. It's a pretty litigious place. Mm -hmm. Patient confidentiality is important. And I think client confidentiality is important. And it's important that if they trust me with the information that you and I discuss it discreetly too. And so, you know, we could be in a barn and they could have the horse's competition standing in front of us and nobody needs to know that maybe this horse is not doing so well this week. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs to know that it went to colic surgery. It's none of their business. You know, the people who need to know are the people who are directly associated. And I hate the rumor mill in general. Yeah. I think a lot of bad stuff happens in rumor mills and a lot of people get their feelings hurt and deals go bad and, and stuff happens because people talk too much and talk out of school. And so I just, I, I have no patience for it personally. And that's just the way I was taught. The reason I brought the question up is I just, I hadn't learned it as much maybe with you. I know there are other vets in this area who definitely follow that, but maybe I hadn't been caught by them or called out for it. <laughs> And I have by you. <laughs> I don't remember calling you out, but... Uh, uh, it's usually just with a glance if I ask you something. Oh, you mean the death eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, that's actually something because there are some farriers that I've worked with where they are pretty nonchalant about discussing things like that with other farriers or other vets that maybe we should be more aware of that. 
look, I mean, it doesn't matter if we're talking about Susie's pony from the backyard, three houses down, who like lives in a run-in shed and has like half a barbed wire fence around it. Or if we're talking about a three-quarter million dollar hunter. Those clients have faith in us as professionals. And I think it's important that we respect that for them. Yeah. Now, it didn't come up organically in the conversation, but I wanted to ask you a question that I've asked several farriers, and it's about burnout. Because Mm. I'm sure vets experience it just as much as we do, especially in the heat of the show season when everybody wants something from you yesterday. Have you experienced burnout? And what are ways that you've dealt with it or ways that you find now that you are able to avoid it? This is an interesting question. So yeah, I flat out burned out once. That's how I left New York the first time. That's how I ended up in New Brunswick. I burned out. I was working a lot and I think I was working, you know, I was working for the clients. I was working for the practice. I was working for all those things, but my God, I was not taking half a second for myself. And it got to the point where I was angry all the time. It got to the point that I would walk in the barn and the horses would turn their butts to me. And I think that's a thing. If you walk into the barn and all the horses turn your butts to you, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Like, why are you doing it? So what I did was I ran. Let's not face our problems head on and like make appropriate changes. I'll just go to a different place and it'll be better. So I went to New Brunswick and I was actually a government vet for nine months, which was excellent decompression time. Also, not professionally enough. You know, there's not enough horses there. And I was used to working on pretty nice horses or or at least being really professionally fulfilled with the amount of things that I was able to do. And so I actually did nine months in New Brunswick, read a lot of books, walked my dog at night, worked eight to four. It was really pretty lovely. (laughs) But I missed being able to practice at the level that I had been accustomed to. So I went back to New York. But in terms of the burnout, I don't even think I knew I was burnout until I had been in New Brunswick for like a month and a half. Like I didn't know that that's what had gotten me there. Now I can see it coming. And for me, probably the biggest thing I can do when I'm starting to feel it is drop everything and back off. Go find a piece of water. Sit. Be quiet. Put down the phone. My clients are super, super, and I think everybody's clients are like this. We just don't ever assume that they'll be like this. If I call my clients and say, hey, so-and-so's got to see your horse on Saturday because I'm going to take five days and go away. They're like, thank God. (laughs) You're going away. That's wonderful. Where are you going? What are you doing? Super. No problem. We'll handle it. They're super kind that way. I think we're always just so scared. Yeah, sure. You know, we're scared to not be their sunshine, you know, because there is something about our egos that when they only want us... It's a little bit of a self-perpetuating ego sort of thing, but it also makes us feel secure. But that's not healthy. We can't do it all, all the time for everyone. And so I think when I'm starting to feel it, that's a big thing. I have to be careful because I am. I love, I love what I do. And I love my clients and I love my horses. You know, I really, really enjoy it. If I'm starting to get frustrated with the horses prematurely, that's a clue. If I'm starting to not want to go to work in the morning, like get up and be like, I get up most mornings and don't get me wrong. I'm not too great before I have my coffee, but (laughs) once I have my coffee, like I'm pretty happy to walk into a barn and pet a horse. And if I stop wanting to pet the horses, then that's a big clue for me. We saw in Ottawa this weekend, one of the horses I work on was in the cross ties in the farrier stall. And I sat down and I don't know anybody. And I was like, is that one of my horses? And they were like, yeah, that's that one. And it was cute because he knew me and he was looking at me. I don't know. Like that for me is kind of half freaking game. I just love playing with them. I get to play with horses for a living. It's super. I think you have to take your time in your space. And I think you have to listen to your body. I will start getting like a really ulcery stomach. I will lose weight. I will be short tempered. And it's almost like the horses just know, right? Like mm-hmm. you don't even you don't even know you're cranky and then the horses will be like spun and you're like, what the heck is going on? It's you, me, whatever. When it starts to be like that, you need to take a minute. You need to get your head out of it. And then I think the other thing is this is a bit of a rough go. You don't have an easy job. I don't have an easy job. These are not easy professions. When things get rough, isolating yourself is not really the answer. You need to have a good, good 
group of people around you. You need to have a support system. Going it alone, I've tried. <laughs> Let me just say I've tried. It really hasn't worked out well. No. It hasn't gotten me far. So I think you have to not be the one who can handle it all on your own with your big broad shoulders. You've got to find your people who are safe to leave on. They're few and far between the people you can lean on, but you've got to find them and you got to use them. In working with you, I've always learned a lot from watching you watch the horses go when we could stand next to each other and I'll even ask you, okay, what is it you're seeing? Do you have a specific routine that you make the horses go through to do that dynamic lameness exam? You mean in terms of when they're being ridden, like things I ask them to do? Yeah. And you and you usually ask that they're ridden too, which I find interesting. Yeah. Honestly, the riding part, when I got to New York, that's just the way it was. And if you get called for a New York pre-purchase in Ontario, they just expect that you're going to have it go under tack. In Ontario, it is the opposite. If you're doing a pre-purchase, it's expected that it's in hand. And if you want it ridden, you have to pre-arrange for that. So I think that expectation is regional and it depends a lot on the type of practice. In thoroughbreds, you can't watch them go under tack unless you go to the track in the morning. You're really not going to see much other than it's drifting right or drifting left or it misses its change at the turn or whatever. But I think it's very reflective of the type of practice. When I started, I started in New York and in that part of the world on those type of horses, we just started watching them go under tack. And so that's what I always did. So that's actually what I'm just more comfortable with. When I got here, the clients weren't used to it. In Niagara, I started in Niagara and I had to work at the racetrack. We definitely couldn't do it at the racetrack. So I had to go back and build the skill set to watch them go in hand more. I mean, not that I never watched them go in hand down there, but I would like watch them jog up, jog back, and then I put the tack on. Now I think both are valuable. I think the racetrack has really taught me a lot. And being forced through Mickey Ponnell to not always look at them under tack has taught me a lot. And I think, honestly, if you're going to do the most complete exam, you need to do both because backs are going to look different under tack. A sore SI is going to look different under tack. A sore neck is going to look different under tack. And all of those problems might look different again on the lunge line or in hand. You know, I have one horse who has not a great neck, looks pretty good under tack, looks pretty good jogging up and back put it on the lunge line to the one direction and it is crippled. So I think there's something different that is seen based on conditions. And I think especially in pre-purchase exams, it's very valuable to see them in all the conditions. So sometimes I'll strip it down and start at square one and do all the pieces. If I know a horse fairly well, I might choose to just see them in one way or another because, you know, I've kind of seen them a bunch. But if it gets weird, I'm not afraid to say, hey, go get the saddle or, hey, I want to see this one in hand or let's put it on the lunge line. Or I think they're all tools. I don't think any one is the panacea because if it was, we'd all be doing that. But there are vets everywhere doing it a million different ways. I do like my flexions under tack. I just see them better. Okay. Are there ways that you learned to see things dynamically? How did you practice that? Are there some tips that you could give farriers on what to look for or how to practice watching horses go in order to become better at watching the dynamic movement. One of the best tips I was ever given was a by a vet in Florida named Haynes Stevens, who I spent a little bit of time with. But he was the first one to really tell me to use my ears. He had a really cool setup where he used to jog his horses up and it was very much designed for the purpose. And it was in Florida and in one of like the sides of the barns and it was like this acoustically brilliant little jog up strip that was on brick but with rubber mats and you could hear a horse so well in this purpose-built space that he had made. That's one tip that I think really makes a big difference. Don't just look at them, start listening to them or close your eyes and listen to them. I think that's really helpful. You know, some days your eyes are better than others. I hate to admit that. Maybe not Tim Ober. I don't know. Maybe his eyes are good all days, but but my eyes get tired at the end of the day. So if you really want to look at some horses, don't do it when you're exhausted because it's just all going to look like mush. <laughs> <laughs> but then I think the other thing is when you're, especially when you're starting to work on a new type of horse, go just watch them do what they do. I will go sit at the horse show and I will watch them. I remember early in my career, not really understanding the hunters and sitting with my friend Kate watching rounds being like, why was this such a great round? The rider's all over the place. What's going on? 
And so she had to take me through and explain step by step. So find somebody who knows a lot about the way these horses move and have them sit with you and go sit at a horse show, watch a dressage class or three, understand the movements. I mean, it's the same thing for young vets coming up. If you want to learn these things, it's not going to get handed to you on a platter. You got to sit and put the hours and just watch and pay attention and watch it. I love when the farriers are around to come to the ring with me because sometimes they notice things about the way a leg is paddling or something about stride length or the arc of the stride that maybe I don't see as well because you guys are so trained to be looking at that, whereas I'm looking at the whole body and the head bob and the hip hike. and So, you know, we look at different things, I think, a lot of the time. But I think that helps too when professionals can hang out and just not be scared or ashamed and just say what you actually see. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes it's none of the above. It's just what we see. So then try to rationalize it back. Does that make sense? Yeah. When you're listening for the footfall, are you listening for a heavy footfall that that's the sound leg and that the other one is probably... Soft. So the soft is the one I'm worried about. Yeah. And I will describe that actually in a report, like a soft horse. If I hear a horse jog up and he's not quite lame, but I hear him. You know, I can't really see it, but I hear it. Then he's soft. And so that's like a 0.25 to a 0.5 out of five. So he's soft right front. Yes, the soft one is the one I'm more worried about. Sometimes it just sounds like trash. You know, it sounds like a sneaker and a dryer and you're like, mm. Mm -hmm. you know, that's when it gets really tricky. But if you're just listening, I listen for the soft one. Okay. Back to the quote that we read in the very beginning. What is it that gets you out of bed and gets you into that arena every morning? I don't go there every morning. <laughs> yeah, I realized that as I was saying it. But you often push those people that are closest to you to step in that arena. I know even for the group, those of us who were hesitant to lead a clinic, you made sure that even if we skipped the first couple in volunteering to do that, that we were in at least one. And then it showed us that we were capable of doing it. And then we carried on. So where does that drive come from to get others to step into the arena? So good example. This year I got to go to the Netherlands and they asked me to do something at a big farrier conference and it was anatomy based. And I was like, whoa, no, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and what I have learned in doing this over the last year. And I remember when you guys asked me to do the OFA and I remember like shaking, presenting to like 80 farriers on anatomy, like not a big deal. I remember shaking and walking up with my fly down. <laughs> I was actually going to make that comment. In, in front of the entire room. I remember all of that being terrifying, but I also over the last year in particular have learned that I have learned so much because I went up there. I have learned so much because I got in the room the magic happens when you're out there. The magic happens when you're vulnerable. You can't go out into the world and expect everybody to share everything with you and give you the secrets and give you the advice and be genuine and honest unless you're willing to do it yourself. And so you have to, you have to go out and be real. And I want to be treated real by, by real people. I want to be around good people who are authentic. I want to be around people who are passionate. And if I'm not willing to show up in the world like that, then how can I expect anybody else to do that? And that is a pet peeve of mine because I have friends, I have people around me who are like the stone of strength <laughs> and they're like untouchables and they're wanting to know all the in-depth stuff. No, you don't get to talk to me about the in-depth stuff, the real stuff, the meaty stuff, unless you earn your spot in the dirt with me. We get to hang out like when we're struggling together. We get to hang out when we can be real, regardless of what's going on. Then you earn a spot to be close and to share the things. Basically, I push you guys to get in the space because it's where the magic happens. It's where the connection happens. It's where the fun happens. When we're all just being our genuine selves and we can hang out in that space, there's so much growth to be had. And we can learn so much from each other. And it's no fun to just be dirty on my own. So I need you guys to grow. I need the people who get in that space in order for myself to develop. It's selfish. Again, I need you to get in the arena with me so that we can all do it. But I, I think it's worthwhile. I genuinely believe that is part of the good stuff in life. Do you have a favorite book? And is there one that you find you want to gift to other people? 
Daring Greatly, Brene Brown. Which is where that quote comes from. Yeah, it is. I love that book, actually. And anybody who's kind of stuck in their life, I will give them that book. I think it's a cool book. It is. I've read it myself Mm -hmm. because you gave it to me. Do you have any other inspirational quotes that you feel you live by? They're all over the place. My house is often a sticky note ridden place. I mean, yes, there are many, but I still think that's probably one of the biggest ones. This one I came across recently and I kind of like it. Back to the whole in the arena thing. You can't take criticism and feedback from people who are not being brave with their lives. That's Brene Brown. And I think that's very, very true. We all get caught in the spot of listening to what all the people are saying about us. But if those people are just standing on the sidelines throwing eggs, why the hell are we listening to what they're saying? Mm -hmm. Right? I don't want to hear the criticism from the vet who never goes out and tries the next thing. I want to hear the criticism or the feedback from the vet who has been in the spot where I am and, and has had some experience and come up with a different answer. Really happy to hear that. Really, really happy to hear that. Mantra wise, I think like there's three things professionally. Do what's right by the horse, give the client peace of mind, and just do your best. If you do those three things every day, what else is there to do? Mm, cool. What would you have been if not a vet? If I could have rode well enough, I would have been a horse trainer. Yeah? Yeah. In what discipline? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. At the time, I probably would have been a dressage rider. Now, I, you know, I hardly have any dressage horses in my life. And I, I love the hunters and I love the jumpers. I really enjoy them. Right. What is your favorite pair of pants to work in? Obviously, jeans. They used to be American Eagle. But now they don't make the cut anymore. So I've had to switch. So now I'm into a really sweet pair of Gap jeans that I'm feeling pretty comfortable in. Khakis are not my thing. I know lots of vets feel comfortable in khakis. It's like a professional thing. It's not authentic to me. I am a jeans girl all the way. And what are your favorite pastimes after work? Hiking the dog, number one. Listening to music, number two. If I get there, reading a book on a beach. That's like my very favorite. But that's not a regular thing. But that is definitely the thing that will chill me out better than most. Okay. And what gets you out of bed in the morning? Honestly, it's like I have a cool job, right? It's a pretty cool deal. So you wake up in the morning and it's a weekday and I've got like a day lined up. And so I guarantee you somewhere in that day, there's going to be something cool. (laughs) It might be that I get to go see one of the clients who really I find entertaining (laughs) for the day. It might be that I get to go see one of the horses that I really enjoy playing with. It might be that I've got a prank check and I'm curious if that mare got in full after all that work we put into it. It might be that I've got to go see if the injections made this one better. Curiosity. I'm always wondering, like, how's this going to go? And so I think curiosity was what gets me out of bed in the morning, fueled by coffee. (laughs) Now, the only other one that we didn't really cover was my question about how you've earned this reputation as a lameness of that to approach or to have in, in specific cases. And where did that come from? How do you think you earn that? And what do you think you do differently than some other vets that just haven't earned that specific reputation? See, I don't even think of myself that way. Of course you don't. I think there are some killer lameness vets around. I do what I do. I think some of what I do is a bit different. Some of what I do is customer service. Some of what I do is client peace of mind. Some of what I do is the way I watch the horses go and my approach. I don't know how different that is from everybody else because I don't ride around with everybody else. Right. I just do what feels right. I'm innately curious about why they're going that way. And I think I'm a little tenacious in terms of finding out sometimes. Like I really want to know it blocked to the foot isn't a good enough answer for me sometimes. I get really excited when I get to put it in the magnet so I get to know exactly what is wrong. Mm -hmm. I like having finite answers. I like knowing specifically what the issue is. Not that it blocks to a low four. I want to know, is it the joint? Is it not the joint? I like that level of stuff. And you can't always do that. You know, sometimes you have clients who just can't afford those kind of things and that's okay. But I like having the opportunity to try and figure it out. And sometimes we figure out cool things without using the stuff. You know, sometimes you're like, well, it's blocking to the medial blank. And so you try something weird with shoe. It's either going to love it, it's going to love a wide branch shoe, or it's going to hate it. And sometimes you can MacGyver the answer out of it. But I think that's all it is. It's just curiosity. I don't know if I'm more curious. You'll have to ask my 
clients. Why do you think? It's definitely the fact that you're so thorough and do want to get to the bottom of things. But a frustrating thing that I run into is that sometimes the vet will say, well, I think it's this. I think they're trying to save the client money. So give it two weeks off and then we'll try again and see what happens. Or they just keep pushing that it must be something simple. They don't get the diagnostic equipment out at all. And then that horse is still lame two weeks later. They make a suggestion and and I try it shoeing wise, but I'm just taking shots in the dark. Nothing has really been diagnosed. It's just a, a guess, an educated guess. Maybe that's it then, because I give people their options. And I've always been taught it doesn't matter if you're in the backyard barn or if you're in a really, really high end place that you need to talk to people and ask them what they want to do. It's not for me to say you're just going to give this two weeks and it's going to be fine. It's for me to say, what do you want to do today? Do you want to block this? Do you want to rest it? It's lame. So where do you want to go with it? Do you want to go on the hoof testers poultice foot? What do you want to do? So I don't make that choice for people. I ask them what they want to do. And you would be surprised which people will choose what. I am often surprised <laughs> which people will choose what. You know, you think the 25-year-old school pony, you think they're not going to block it. They're going to rest it. They're like, no, I need that thing back next week. <laughs> <laughs> block it. And so it's surprising sometimes. I, I think it's hard to predict. And so unless you give people the option, then they can't choose what they're going to do. I think farriers fall into the exact same trap. We assume that the client isn't going to want to spend the money, so we don't even offer the option. And I know I've been guilty of that. And I've been surprised by maybe when they've called the vet in and had some crazy expensive treatment done. And I thought, well, geez, I didn't offer to put bar shoes on because I thought that that might be a cost prohibitive thing. So I think that is a good piece of advice for farriers and vets is to offer all of the options, A, B, and C. These are the costs involved and the potential success of us discovering what the problem is or solving the problem and let them make the decision. You'll be surprised. Colic surgery taught me that. You sit there and you talk to these people and you're like, this person doesn't have any money. What are they thinking? We can't put a dollar value on what these horses are worth to their people. Yeah, exactly. You can never predict it. It's it's completely not predictable. So I think you have to treat Susie in the backyard. Susie doesn't get better care than some really big fancy horse. Susie has the same options. And so it's up to the client what they do. Yeah. Don't take the choice away from them. Don't take the choice away. And maybe that's the difference. Maybe I just give them a choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for doing this and taking the time. Thank you really for having appreciate me. It. Before we finish up, I wanted to say a few words about a special project to me called Foot for Thought. Just over a year ago, my friend Dr. Andrea Dubay approached myself and four other farriers, Barney Cummings, Kathy Lesperance, Mark Struthers, and Justin Argent about starting a project together. She wanted to learn more about what it is we farriers do and to be able to create a series of clinics where vets and farriers could work and learn together while focusing on specific lamenesses or equine podiatry issues. We all understood the need for a safe space where vets and farriers could let their guards down and feel free to ask questions they wouldn't normally ask in front of clients out of fear of looking bad. The group came up with the name Foot for Thought. We ran our first clinic and had a relatively good turnout. Mostly farriers, but some vets. Then we started a closed Facebook group where vets or farriers could post cases they were working on and seek out the opinions and advice of others. The closed group ensuring, once again, that the discussions were out of the public realm to ensure a safe space. It started to grow. People joined up from all over North America. The next clinic grew too. More vets, more farriers, more discussion. We started broadening our base and having vets and farriers from well outside our area come in to lead the clinics. It has been and continues to be quite the journey. The keenness of everyone who participates is palatable. I'm proud to be part of such a great collaborative group that is doing so much to help equine professionals help out the horses in their care. If you are a vet, farrier, chiropractor, or equine massage therapist, please send a member request to the Foot for Thought Facebook page. Or you can message me directly and I'll get you on the email list for upcoming events and special announcements. And that concludes this episode of the podcast. Until we meet again, take care of yourselves and each other out there. Thank you very much for listening.